as provided for in the governor's executive order. And with that, I would like to ask uh, Kathy Poe to uh, call the roll. Member Hale? Here. Member Cubine? Here. Member Mason? Here. Member Snyder? Here. Member Dutton Mitchell? Here. Okay, we have a quorum. And the next item is uh, consider the minutes of the November 17th board meeting. If everybody's had a chance to review them, um, do I have a motion? I'll make a motion to accept the meeting minutes for the January 17th meeting. Do we have a second? I'll second. Do we have any corrections, changes, or discussion on the minutes? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Minutes adopted. Item number three, uh, consider financials for the month ending November 30th, 2020, and also an update on our delinquencies. Uh, David Denton. Thank you, Mr. Cubine, and good evening, members of the board. Um, I'd like to go ahead and start first with the update uh, on how COVID-19 has impacted uh, billing processes at FPB and also steps that we're taking to help our customers with past due bills get caught up. Uh, we have with us tonight Cassie uh, Estel, our customer service supervisor, that's going to be uh, helping me with this. So, Cassie, I'll go ahead and turn over to you to kind of give a little update on, on this process of past due uh, accounts and what we're doing to uh, to change that process a little bit. Good evening, members of the board. Can everyone hear me? I haven't done this before yeah. via video. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I just want to give a quick review kind of of what FPB has done. Um, back in March, COVID started and we suspended late payment, late fees and disconnects. Then in May, the governor actually entered a moratorium to suspend those. And then in beginning of November, that was lifted. So at that time, we could resume late fees for businesses and still hold off on residential. And we were required to enter into payment plans for all of our customers that were impacted negatively during the COVID pandemic. And FPB kind of went a few steps extra. Um, we have continued to waive late fees for both business and residential through the end of the year. And we placed all of our customers on default payment plans. Um, the minimum required was six months, but we chose to do different buckets depending upon the balance to give people more time. So we have payment plans that extend from six months to 24 months, depending on the balance. And we asked customers to pay their current charges plus X amount towards their arrears each month, beginning with their December statements. Um, one of the things that the plant board wanted to ensure that we did and that the governor kind of wanted everyone to do is to ensure that we made people aware of this. So we took several steps. Um, we started with direct calls from the CSRs to any customer that was past due. We put things in the state journal on our website on around 10. Um, then we did a direct letter to every customer that was past due. We recently did a mass email to each of those customers that we had a valid email address for. And we also did a mass recorded call to every customer that had a phone number on file. Um, just making them aware of the default payment plans as well as the healthy at home utility fund that was still available to them. We pushed all that to them beginning in November and just ended um, last week, sending them emails and phone calls again to make them aware of that. So as of closeout Friday, which was our cycle one customers, um, we had approximately 35% of our customers not make that first payment. Um, so we felt like that was a pretty good number. So kind of where we're at right now is 35% um, of people that were past due for cycle one paid no payment at all. Um, but we did have over uh, approximately 900 customers almost to pay all or something towards that payment plan. With cycle two, we won't have those numbers until we do close out again at the end of the month. And of course, today's due date. So we don't have that number just quite yet. So uh, Cassie, the next step for the 35% mm -hmm. that didn't make a payment, didn't respond to whatever. Yes, sir. What happens next? The next thing happens is they're gonna get a second notice sent to them again at the end of the month advising them that hey you missed your payment you're still past due and you are subject to disconnect at this point 
Um, and then if they still don't pay into the 1st of January, we would begin disconnections, uh, weather permitting on or after January 5th is the plan at this time. Okay. Does anybody have any questions of Cassie on the status and the process? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've got a question. Cassie, sure. Um, you, you made mention that you said 35% of the people didn't pay anything. Did that, does that mean they didn't pay their full bill and the arrears or is that, is that, did they, did they pay the December bill? I guess what I'm asking. No, sir. That means they paid nothing. They paid no payment at all. You're welcome. Okay. okay. Any other questions of Cassie? Okay. David, you want to, uh, Cassie, did you have anything else to add or? No, sir. I mean, if you all have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, I just wanted anyone that was watching the meeting tonight to kind of know the process and how FPV ended up where we are and reiterate to customers. We still are working with people. Um, our CSRs are here and available and can do payment arrangements. So even if you missed your payment and we've taken you off the default, you can still give us a call. We can still make a payment arrangement with you. You can still reach out to the agencies to the end of the month and they still have funds available as far as we know. So even if you've missed the payment and been taken off, still reach out to us, still do a payment of a different sort with us. We can work with you and are trying to do that. So okay. thank you, Cassie. And thank all your, uh, the, all your staff for everything you're all doing. Yes, sir. Thank you. I just had one comment. Um, yeah. Uh, had watched, I think, the COVID meeting on Monday. And I think if both the city and the county have given money to Roslyn to help people pay their utility bills. So besides through community action, our customers do have the option of going to a local church and applying for funds that the city and county have set aside through Roslyn. John, the other thing, you might want to mention those agencies again to the public in case someone doesn't know who they are. Hey, Cassie, you want to write down those? Yeah. Um, the ones that I'm aware of, and I apologize, I don't have it right in front of me, but locally it's Bluegrass Community Action, the Salvation Army, um, and ROSM. And what that means with Bluegrass Community Action, they're working with the federal program as well. So you go to them and they actually are um, taking applications for the Healthy at Home Utility Fund as well as their local normal LIHEAP fund. So if you don't qualify for one program, you might qualify for another. And we've had a lot of customers who have um, qualified for both. So they've actually gotten money from both programs. And with ROSM, um, a lot of people, we tell all of our customers, you don't have to have an affiliation with any church or a denomination. You can go to any local church and make an application and they all pull their resources through ROSM. So a lot of people think they have to attend a church or be affiliated and that is not accurate. You can pick any local church in our community. We probably have 50 or 60 and you can go to them and do an application through them and they will submit it to Rosam on your behalf. Okay. And then Thank the Salvation you. Army. Yes, sir. Okay. Mm -hmm. You'd like to remind our customers, anyone that's watching, uh, watching this that would like to help a customer that might be past due this time of year. Uh, if you go to the FPB website, it's fpb.cc, go up to the community tab. You'll see at the bottom, there is a power gift certificate program. Customers can, uh, or anyone can give a gift certificate to someone for the holiday to uh, help them with their utility bills. Also, we have our roundup program where customers can uh, agree to round up their bill to the next dollar. Uh, the difference between uh, the roundup amount will go into a fund sent to Bluegrass Community Action to help customers also. So that's two ways that people can proactively help uh, through FPB. So. Okay. Thanks, David. Thanks, Cassie. Uh -huh. right. David, you want to go on? I'm sorry. Well, we've, we've provided for you all the, the financial statements, our statement of net position uh, as of November 30th, our statement of revenue expenses and change in net position uh, for our both all three divisions and all of our administrative departments. Uh, along with our cash and investment schedule and our uh, check registers for our two most active bank accounts. Uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions the board may have, but as you can tell, we're in, in line with revenue and uh, expense estimates and are, are, are moving forward through the first five months of the fiscal year. I'd be glad to answer any questions the board may have. And I guess in January, at the January meeting, 
after we go through the two billing cycles and we see, we'll get an idea of just how much the delinquencies have come down by people making payments or agreed to make payments, won't we? Yes, sir. We'll have a lot more information by the, by the January regular meeting. Okay. Uh, any questions of David? Okay. Do I have a motion to accept the financials? So moved. Uh, we have a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, 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 financials approved. Next item is uh, public comment. Uh, do we have anyone signed up for public comment other than for the uh, the Kimi matter? Kathy? Not to my knowledge, no. Okay. And then on the customer website comments, do we have any, have those all been addressed? As far as I know, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, we don't have any potential or related party transactions report. This is on the departmental reports. And I think, uh, Vint, you were going to handle this and you had some uh, department heads that were going to speak individually and you were going to give a summary of everything else, weren't you? Yes, sir. Um, I was just going to step through those departments, if that's fine with you, and then I'll get yes. those folks to step forward. And, okay. Uh, so real quickly, starting with telecom, um, I'm going to have Adam jump on here in just a second and give you an update on Fiber to the Home Project. But uh, they've been doing some fiber writing, routing and splicing for our AMI testing, so that's been going well. And uh, we're getting ready to move the first phase of those satellites up at the reservoir. But um, Adam, if you would, uh, give the board an update on Fiber to the Home. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, good evening, board. Uh, the status update, the last update we gave was in August. And so uh, as of today, um, in August, we were right at 40, uh, 4,000 homes passed. As of today, we've uh, increased that to about 2,500 more homes. So we're looking at about 25% of our current homes passed would have access to uh, the FTTH. Uh, we're about $1 million out of the $1.9 million budgeted for this time, uh, for this physical year. So that's kind of tracking pretty good. Uh, we sent an RFP out for engineering uh, help, and we're hoping to have that back in January and start reviewing those and kind of bring the board an updated uh, IRP to see about speeding the uh, project up. I'll be happy to answer any questions you might have at this time. Also, there was a, a document sent out earlier today that kind of gave you a breakdown of the areas we were in and uh, the status. So. Okay. When will the first people actually be hooked up or using it? We're hoping to actually sign up some friendlies in the month of January. Uh, okay. We did receive um, the head in equipment, so we're going to start racking that the first, uh, probably right after the, the holidays and get that turned up and start testing. At that point, we'll have some friendlies involved and, you know, maybe February, uh, March timeline be looking for customers. Will the 1.9 million uh, take care of us this year? Will you need more funds or will that be enough? We're gonna, we're gonna be close. And uh, okay. I talked to Ben earlier, we'll probably gonna have a couple meetings uh, in January to see, as you can kind of look at the, the PDF, it kind of gives you a breakdown of cost of certain areas. And so if you start doing the math, we're, we're really pushing up against that 1.9. So we'll take a hard look at, you know, money spent this year to see if there's any available funds to divert that way and just, you know, kind of take it from there. Okay. Do we, does anyone have any, some uh, questions for Adam? Okay. Uh, next okay. report, Vin. Yes, sir, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and also the uh, telecom report to the statistics you're used to see in our pages 97 through 100 of your board package. Uh, we'll move on to electric then. Uh, those are pages 103 to 106. Um, they've been working on AMI testing, and I'll have Travis McCullough, the chief electrical engineer, uh, give you a little update here on that AMI uh, project right now. <coughs> sure. Good evening, everyone. Um, the AMI project reached an important milestone this week. We installed our, our first data collector, so thanks to the cable department with the help with that. We are officially underway with testing. That testing process will last probably another five or six months or so before we're really into full-scale deployment, but we've made good progress today so far. So we're okay. testing. Okay. Okay. 
So um, also uh, we're doing some reconductor projects in the downtown area. We're constantly doing those all over our system. Of course, those are part of our budget projects that keeps our system in good working order. So we are working on some of those. So people may see our trucks in the downtown area working on some of that. Um, I'll move on to the SEPA report. Those are pages 107 through 109. And for the month of October, we made uh, $22,345. So that gives us for the calendar year, we're up about 556,000. So that's a positive note. And uh, for the water distribution, um, that report, yeah, the statistics you normally see are on pages 113 through 115. I would mention that the uh, main crews, they've completed their main replacement out on West Main that they were working on last week. And the road repairs have been made to that. So the crew uh, will be working on an extension in the Shore Acres Road area. They're going to be installing about 1,100 feet of water main to serve uh, customers in that area. And then, of course, the painting contractor is nearing completion on the 127 tank. Um, they, uh, if the weather permits, we hope to get that tank back in service by the end of the month. So that's wrapping up and things are going well there. And uh, I'll quickly give you the water treatment plant report and then I'll let David Billings, the director of water, give you an update on the reservoir. So your statistics on the water treatment plant are on page 117. So uh, the water treatment plant treated 195 million gallons in November for an average of 6.5 million gallons a day. And we had about 2.16 inches of rain in November, which is below normal. And then the, the flow of the river was slightly lower than normal for this time of year as a relation to that. Um, but at this time, I'll let David Billings come on. He's the director of water and uh, he'll give you an update on the reservoir project. Good evening, board. Uh, as you're aware, the landscape committee recommendations were finalized last month. Uh, since that time, agency review plans have been completed. Uh, Division of Water review package has been submitted to Division of Water. Our construction plans and specs are nearing completion. We expect to bring those to the board in January for approval. We expect to take bids in February, award the bid, execute the contract, and send notice to proceed to the contractor in March. We expect construction to start in April of 21 and be completed in March of 2022. I'll be happy to answer any questions. So are, from that schedule, are we on, on track for our, our projected timeline that we wanted for the reservoir replacement? Yes, sir. Okay. Does anyone have some questions of David? Okay. If not, Mr. Chairman, I'll conclude my uh, report of the operations side of things. Okay. Thank you, sir. Um, yes, sir. And without any further questions, we'll go to number seven, the uh, 7.1 presentation of the Destiny Ward by Kimi. I think you've got good news for us, don't you, Ms. Phillips? I do. Thank you for allowing me to uh, speak to everyone. I've uh, We've been joined by several representatives from Kentucky Employers Mutual Insurance. They're our workers' comp provider. We uh, call them Kimi, and they are uh, a very good partner and uh, with the, working with us on um, our safety program, along with Charlie Hamilton, who's here. He's our uh, agent, and I'd just like to turn this over to Jeff Floyd, who is the safety and loss control manager with Kimi, and he's going to talk a little bit about the award we're receiving. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. As <clears throat> Kim said, my name is Jeff Floyd, and I work with Kimi, and uh, I, we, we do really appreciate you guys having us uh, tonight. And one of the things that I, I guess wanted to kind of speak a little bit about the award, about 10 years ago, we, we wanted to come up with a way that we could identify and uh, in some way uh, reward or uh, pat on the back, maybe to the to what we would call the best of our best accounts, and what, so the way we chose to do that is we we looked at some uh, identif uh, identifying markers, you might say that the uh, kind of separated the field, and we have and that was a job because we have about twenty one twenty two thousand policyholders at any given time and so one of the things that we did is we looked at the experience mod and the loss ratio 
And, but we also wanted to look at things such as what type of safety program they had. Did we have a relationship with them? And did we feel comfortable with the, the work that they were doing and that sort of thing? So uh, we've, we, we've done this now for the last 10 years, like I said. And, and this year, we, the, the criteria that we selected was you had to have a, an experience mod of a 0.80. And that's kind of an insurance uh, equation that, that kind of uh, takes a look at you versus kind of everyone else. And it stands to reason if you have um, a low injury rate and versus uh, the premium that's paid, your experience mod is going to be uh, below a one. And, and in a loss ratio, we selected 45% or less. And when we did that, we looked at, uh, we narrowed that down from 21,000, uh, we'll say, to 56 companies that we insure. And at that point, we sent out a, a questionnaire and we sent that to Kim and she filled out some some questions that basically we wanted to to obviously we knew about you guys quite well but you know w one of the things this year we wanted to know was how you were handling the, the uh, COVID-19 and the pandemic and also you know your other safety programs that you have in place and so forth and and you know once we got that back uh, from those that responded, we, we narrowed it down to 28, uh, winners and very happy to say that you guys are, are one of those. And, and I want to also say of the 10 years that we have done this, you all have won the award. This is the ninth time and probably, you know, more, more than anything, winning at one time, two times is a big deal but winning it nine times is incredible. And it, in fact, we have a one a company that has won it all 10 years. And we have one other company that has won it nine years. And, and so that that's amazing because, you know, it, we always say usually when we, a couple of things about this award is one, it takes everybody in the organization to win it because it, you can't have, 25% of your organization working safely and winning an award like this. It takes, it takes everybody. And it tells us that you all have a culture of safety that um, you all have been able, uh, and Kim has always been extremely complimentary, I guess you might say of the board and the support that from the top down that she's been given and you have to have that. And so that that's a pat on the back to you guys for supporting uh, the safety program and the efforts that that she and others have, have put forth and and uh, it, it, it uh, is a great reflection of the the business as a whole and then of course you know your agent too you know there there's there was a book written i won't bring up the author but uh the it takes a village is, is the name of it and it really does when it comes to workers compensation you have an agency that is in there uh, working for you and and working with us and, and you all teaming with us together as a partnership and, and, but you guys do the work and congratulations. And, and we're very, very proud to have your workers compensation covered. I'm very happy for Kim because I know the amount of work she puts into the safety and health of, of your employees. And it, it's, uh, I guess in a lot of ways you could say that it is, uh, recognizing something that we really already knew you know we knew kim did a great job we've always been very comfortable and so without saying anything else congratulations and and uh, we appreciate the partnership thank you and kim thank you for you and and your whole team and all the employees because like he said it's it's everybody working together and y'all have done an exceptional job i really yes, appreciate it i um in in a lot of ways my job are, is made a lot easier by the excellent employees we have. And, uh, and yeah, it, they're the ones that bear the brunt of the safety program and the rules and all and carry it out. And, and you know, 
I've heard people say, well, of course people want to go home safely. Well, yeah, but to get to this level, it takes more than just, uh, you know, a casual effort. It, uh, it takes every day in and out and we're in a hazardous job. So I appreciate our employees and all the work that they do. So. Well, it makes, it's a big deal because not only are we're protecting our employees, but it also means our costs are lower, which means the ratepayers are, are not paying for, for accidents. That's right. Either, so it's, our, it's important. Uh, our rates are you know, much, much lower than than they have been in times past, That, as Charlie can attest. So, um, yeah, it, it saves the ratepayers money, no doubt. Yeah. Does anybody else have any uh, comments or questions for Kim? Okay. Kim, thank you. Uh, next is item 7.2, uh, update on the home energy assistant audit. This was a follow-up to a couple of questions I think both uh, Steve uh, and Catherine had regarding the home energy audits and what we knew about the, uh, how well it was working and so forth. So, Travis, you want to take that? Sure, be happy to. We have provided in the board package a couple of a couple of data points for the board to consider on the home energy audit project, first of which is a, a map. Of, it, it's kind of a general area of all the customers that have received audits so far. So if you're looking at that, you can see we've got a, a pretty good distribution across the system of, of customers that have taken advantage of that program. We've also provided, a, I guess you would call it a brief statistical analysis of, of the entire electric rate class, or I should say the residential class versus those customers that received an audit. And, you know, for such a small data set, it, it's kind of hard to to pin down any definitive answer. There was a, a little a little difference. It was a little better on the, the side of the, the customers who received audits. Um, again, with that, that little amount of data, I'm not sure we can take a whole lot of, from that. Um, but to add to that, to just kind of add some some clarity to those numbers. We reached out to all the customers that have received an audit so far. We were able to get a hold of, looks like 20 of those customers were, were willing to talk to us and chat about the, the project. Of those 20 we talked to, it looks like we've had six that are, are currently making changes to their home based off the audit and an additional seven more that are either planning to or are or, or thinking about making changes to their home based on, on the energy audit. The, the other seven that we talked to had no immediate plans uh, in the short term. Was a there, was there reason for not pursuing it at this time a financial or just didn't see the benefit of it? Or did you have any feel for why they weren't pursuing it? Yeah, they, they were kind of a, a little of both. Some of them, you know, the homes were, were in actually fairly good condition. There wasn't a lot to be changed. That was, that was part of it as well. But other customers said they may just wait till a year or so down the road, um, just for, as you mentioned, financial reasons for waiting. Okay. Does any board members have any questions for Travis or and what the next steps are? I guess when, I guess based on COVID and that, we'll probably be what, spring or later before we resume audits? Yeah, they, they've mostly been shut down. I guess we're kind of, that's a big question for everybody um, is, is when will we be able to start back? I think we've done maybe 10 or so this budget year. So there is, there are funds for more if, if that's what we, we so choose to do. Um, again, okay. like you said, hopefully by springtime, we're, we're a little more comfortable. But. Okay. Any board members want some other information or some questions to Travis or to make any comments? Chair. Yes. Uh, first, I want to thank Travis for responding to the board's request to, to get more information and um, I realize right now that, that we have um, low numbers as far as gathering data, but um, hopefully um, we'll have increased numbers and um, it would, well, I would like to know if you have like a plan to sort of develop a survey or, or um, some other way to follow up because, you know, I realize people don't do these things right away. So you might get a different answer in another six months or another year. Um, it would just be nice to continue to gather this data if a customer's willing. Do you have any plans for that? Sure, and I, I think to add, to add to that, it would, it certainly makes more sense to do that, especially considering, 
you know, if you got one in the past few months, let's say, um, you know, it's likely you wouldn't have, have started on that project. So yes, I, I think that definitely makes sense. And we can do that. We can, we can kind of grow and craft that survey a little better as well. These were, you know, pretty general questions. Um, but yeah, we can, we can continue to explore that. And we might want to polish up our survey instrument. That is when we reopen again to make uh, from our kind of data collection that to have that. So as we expand and do more in the future, um, uh, we kind of have a more formalized process to, to kind of assess or analyze the information. Yeah, John. Uh, yeah. Yeah, just a statement. One, I agree with Kathy, and I'm glad you're doing these things and and uh, capturing information. But again, when you look at the chart, you look at you look. It kind of confirms what I was trying to was talking about earlier. There are pockets of places where there aren't any, and if you look at where the where the blue dots are, they're pretty much in the places where people have the means of uh, 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 the discretionary funds or the other, where there are not any other problems. So mm -hmm. I, I would again ask that we try to, to I guess, force some of these artists in places where you don't see any dots. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm looking, I mean, when I look at this, I, I see, well, I won't name any areas, but I see areas that, that I'm sure are in need of these artists, but probably for one reason or another, aren't able to, uh, uh, to I guess, let these artists be undertaken in their homes. So I, I just for the equity uh, of the ratepayers in, in Frankfurt, I think we got to figure out a way to get these free audits mm -hmm. to people who really need, probably, need, well, everyone needs them, but needs them probably as much or maybe more. Kathy Lindsay, could you, uh because we're going to have a little time before we open them back up. Could you work with Travis and maybe do some targeted outreach in those areas and Annette to outreach those areas that Steve's talking about? Yeah, we can work together and uh, we have some other uh, resources that we can use to reach those people. Sure. Okay, good. You know, one thing and again, John, and I, I, I really want, want that to happen, what John just suggested. And I don't, I don't know the answer, but, I don't. I don't know if it if, if it's gonna, if it's not going to take a more proactive approach, you know. And, and right now, you can't do what I'm thinking is knocking on someone's door and saying, you know, we offer this service in those areas that aren't being represented on this map. That that's obviously not something practical right at the moment. But when everything calms down and and gets back somewhat to normal, uh, it might take something to that effect. Because I I don't know if if you know some kind of education or uh, publication gets there. It's, it's okay. just, a, it's just a institutionalized, I hate to use that word, an institutionalized yeah. part of our uh, 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 society. Okay. Any other comments or uh, on this information? Okay, uh, Kathy, then if you and Travis would follow up and then maybe when uh, it comes time that we can reopen this, uh, let Gary know, let's put it back on the agenda and then you can describe what kind of outreach we've developed uh, to begin that process. Sure, absolutely. Well do. Okay. Uh, next item is item, let's see. Item 7.3, which is a review and discuss draft resolution regarding Kimi IRP and power supply. And what I might mention on this one is I'm going to turn it over to Catherine here in just one second. And what we're going to have here with the board's uh, permission is kind of a six part process here. Uh, Catherine's going to talk a little bit about the issue. Uh, and then I think Catherine may there, we may have one public comment on it. We've also gotten uh, in online or in person virtually comment. And then we've gotten a number of, uh, of a comment sent into us and Kathy Poe is going to read those into the record. And then Kimi is going to come on and do a response. And then I'm going to turn it back to Gary and Ben and Catherine for kind of the next steps. So with that, Catherine, you want to take it? Yes. Thank you. Um, first of all, I uh, want to thank um, Brent Swagger, who's uh, a friend and a neighbor for approaching me and, um, 
uh, getting his thoughts on matters um, related to, obviously, to the plant board and sustainability and introducing me to Andy McDonald, who's with Apogee and also in Vision Franklin County. Um, you know, one of my mandates, uh, all, all board mandate members' mandates is to um, understand what our customers, what our community, what, uh, what they want, what their priorities are. So I appreciate um, Brent and Andy um, reaching out and, um, and expressing their opinions to me. And um, then Andy McDonald um, went a step further and drafted a six point resolution concerning um, KYMEA uh, and particularly their um, IRP that is uh, ongoing right now. Um, and so um, he's also presented some written comments and, um, but I do think he's joined us. So I would like to give him an opportunity now if he wanted to make any um, oral comments concerning um, his proposed resolution. Sure. Can we uh, hook Andy up? How you doing, Andy? I'm good, good to see you all. Yeah. Thank, thank you for the chance to speak. Um, so I, I'm a, a Frankfurt Plant Board uh, customer and located in Franklin County. Um, I'm, I want to encourage you to pass the resolution concerning the KYMEA's integrated resource plan and power supply. This is an important time for the KYMEA and FPB as they consider what their future power supply will include. An IRP gives them the chance to make careful long-term decisions to consider multiple options and weigh risks. In 2017, a consultant from Energy and Environmental Economics advised KYMEA to conduct an IRP and suggested that it would have been wise to do one before signing their original power contracts in 2016. The consultant noted that KYMEA had purchased considerably more capacity than its members needed, with the result that FPB would be paying an additional $2 million per year through 2022 for capacity that it did not need. In 2022, KYMEA's 100 megawatt coal contract with Dynagy will expire. This presents a great opportunity for KYMEA and FPB to reassess their needs and right-size their power supply. This is one reason why it is critical for the IRP to be based on reasonable load forecasts, using a clear and transparent analysis, making all data available for public review. The decisions being made about KYME's power supply will have financial impacts for FVB customers for decades to come. This IRP is happening during a time of dramatic change in the world's energy supply. Utilities large and small are switching from coal and natural gas to renewable energy, battery storage, and demand side management. In the past couple of years, two municipal utilities in Kentucky, Henderson Municipal Power and Light and Owensboro Municipal Utilities have decided to shut down their own coal plants, decisions that resulted from their own IRPs. Each are including large solar facilities in their future power supplies. The Northern Indiana Public Service Company last year decided to shut down its coal plants, concluding that its least cost option was to switch to a mix of wind, solar, battery storage, and demand conservation, another decision resulting from their IRP. These trends indicate that any long-term commitments to fossil fuel generation pose serious financial risks to FPB's customers. The risk of getting locked into long-term contracts that could soon become overpriced stranded assets. Although KYMEA has two 10-year contracts for fossil fuel generation still, the expiration of the Dynagy contract is a critical chance to reduce the cost and risk of FPB's power supply. The KYMEA does not have an urgent need to replace the Dynagy contract. This gives it the chance to carefully weigh its options, which includes short-term purchases on the MISO power market. The resolution on the agenda tonight is important 
so that KYMEA understands its members' concerns and priorities. I have observed several KYMEA board meetings this past year and participated in two community IRP focus groups organized by the agency. It's clear that the agency has an interest in adding more natural gas generation, whether through investing in a power plant or via a power purchase agreement. A new coal contract is another option that's been discussed. It is appropriate for these options to be explored within the IRP process. The FPB's oversight can ensure that these options are thoroughly evaluated alongside all other potential options. Your diligence is needed to ensure that the KYMEA does not short circuit the IRP process and try to sign a new coal or gas contract before the IRP is complete and reasonable time allowed for it to be reviewed by the public. Thank you, that concludes my comments. Thank you, Andy. Catherine? Um, I believe we have some written comments submitted um, and I believe is Kathy Poe gonna read those? Yes, Kathy, you wanna read those into the record? I sure will. <clears throat> Uh, this first one is from Ben Griffith. Uh, it says, to whom it may concern, I support the resolution encouraging open and transparent planning and opposing any effort to enter into new contracts for fossil fuel energy and production. I support the study of options from MISO market, opposing any long-term commitment to fossil fuel power. It is time to move forward to a marketplace of renewable energy. The next presidential administration and Congress will be placing a priority on doing this. We should be transitioning now. We are long, long time customers of FPB. Ben and Patricia Griffith. Uh, the second comment is from Anna Marie Pavlik Rosen. Uh, <clears throat> The IRP process requires the careful consideration of all options and clear communication with ratepayers. Lowest cost reliable electricity is important for the residents of Frankfurt. Making the best possible choices for the community is the role of our municipal utility board. FPB needs to make its voice heard by guiding KYMEA and making shrewd energy decisions. No new contract should be made before the IRP <clears throat> excuse me, before the IRP and the MISO transmission study are complete. In addition, future contracts from non-renewable energy source, sources should be short, limited to three years to minimize the economic loss of long-term commitments. FPB is 54% of the energy that KYMEA purchases and is now burdened with paying the cost of excess capacity. Cautious decisions looking at each option and buying only what is needed will benefit all KYMEA members. The Paducah capacity should be reduced from 90 to 30 megawatts before December 2020 deadline. Please vote in favor of the resolution being considered tonight and deliver it to KYMEA immediately. These priorities need to be part of the December KYMEA board meeting. Anna Marie Rosen, former FPB chair. And the third and final comment uh, came from Mr. Andy McDonald, the Dear FPB Board. On behalf of Envision Franklin County, I urge you to support the resolution regarding the KYMEA's IRP and power supply. The KYMEA is considering options for meeting their members' power supply needs, which will have financial consequences for the FPB's customers. It is important for the KYMEA to know that their member communities are paying attention to their integrated resource planning IRP process and understand their members needs and priorities. In 2022, one of the KYMEA's 100 megawatt coal power contracts will expire. This presents a good opportunity for KYMEA to reassess their members needs and shed excess power capacity and unnecessary costs. It is therefore critical for the KYMEA to complete their IRP process and make the report available for public review before engaging in any new power supply contracts. The FPB should ensure that new capacity will be needed, have a full understanding of the options available, and understand the risks involved in each option before KYMEA enters new power supply contracts. 
the FPV has another opportunity pending this month with the potential for KYMEA to reduce their commitment to the Paducah Power PPA from 90 megawatts to 30 megawatts. This immediate opportunity to reduce contract commitments should be carefully assessed by FPB staff before the December deadline. Passing this resolution regarding KYMEA's IRP and power supply will provide important guidance to the KYMEA staff regarding the concerns and the priorities of the FPB and its customers. Sincerely, Andy McDonald, member of Vision Franklin County. Thank you, Kathy. I think at this point, uh, Gary, I think, Catherine, as I understand it, when you received the resolution, then you forwarded it to Gary, and Gary had asked Kimi to review it and provide a written response, which is in, um, everybody's in the board book, it's a public record. So I guess at this point, Gary, uh, do you have a representative from Kimi available to uh, provide a response to the draft resolution? Yes. I mean, if you like to, I believe uh, KYME CEO, Doug Bush, he is joined the meeting right now. If you would like him to explain his you know, response. Okay, is that okay with you, Catherine? Yes. Okay. Doug, thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. I think Doug's on mute. All right, how about now? Here we go. All right. <laughs> well, thank you for having me. and. Uh, we appreciate everybody's comments. You know, I've uh, I've known Andy for a while, and I appreciate all the things that he contributes and and asks of the agency. It's uh, it's good to have the public feedback. Um, the resolution before you, we addressed the six points, and we are happy to go through those individually if you'd like us to, or if uh, if, if there are certain ones you would like uh, like us to address, so we can do that as well, um, Mr. Chairman. I guess in the interest of of how the you would like to proceed. I think if the board, if it's okay with the board, Catherine, you, I think probably it's, I think this is an important matter. I think it's probably good for you to go through each point. Okay, very good. So uh, we're in total agreement uh, on, certainly on bullet number one, that is uh, conducting our IRP uh, process in open, transparent manner, making all the data available, publicly available, and and throw a, show a thorough analysis of our uh, what we're looking at. So we have a wealth of experience in the agency of people that own IRPs. I've been doing them for 30 plus years. I did it as a consultant. I did it at individual companies. And so I understand the process of presenting it to boards and, and uh, even public service commissions and so forth. Um, the tr thing we're always careful about is a lot of our agreements on non-disclosure. So we can't necessarily share some of the details of what the pricings are, but we're very happy to share uh, the process share a lot of like the load forecast, for instance, we can share all of that when it becomes available, the scenarios. And we've cer certainly had a number of uh, open records requests that we've responded to those. I was very happy to see that uh, Andy and some of the other uh, members of that uh, Envision Franklin County and Apogee um, both come to our board meetings and went to our community focus groups. We went to a lot of uh, uh, time and expense to make sure we had community focus groups that everybody could participate in. and and able to have feedback and questions. And we have a, a website that's public as well for anyone to go out there and, and give feedback there as well and, and the things they're looking for in the power supply. What the board decides to do, and remember uh, this is a board decision across the, all of our 11 members, is gonna be a balance of low cost and risk. And uh, certainly environmental is a, a key part of that. Uh, financial stability is a key part of it as well. And they wanna make sure that we have ample power for all of our members to make sure that their lights stay on. And at the same time, it's very competitive. Uh, the power supply we have in place right now over the last two years has lowered the rates of somewhere in the neighborhood of 14% of where the members were before. And so that was a very good out of the gate uh, decision by the board. They were conservative in nature by design to make sure they, they had a clear power supply in place. But as they move forward, they always knew that if they have staggered contracts that expire and new opportunities come up, we'll evaluate the new opportunities that are available. So the uh, transparency is very important and we're happy to share anything. If, if there are certain things they, the public feels we're not sharing, um, we will make sure we get it to them to the extent we can and it's not considered under non-disclosure or confidential. Um, number two, so, um, and please, uh, if there's other, if you'd like to say we then fully address each of these, uh, please let me know. 
Uh, the community focus groups are laid out in the, uh, um, as part of number one of when they took place and who participated, how they are advertised, and those types of things. Uh, number two was entering into any new contracts for coal or natural gas generation or build a generation plant uh, prior to completion of the IRP. Um, that, that will happen. and We will have a completion of an IRP before the board decides. There are certain elements the board has to decide along the way, uh, but they won't enter in any, any new contracts for coal or natural gas uh, prior to that completion of the IRP. So that is uh, that we agree with that statement, and uh, we think that's an important aspect as well. The, the board at this board meeting will have information in front of them on decisions they have to make by the end of the year. But these are not new contracts, either contract um, decisions on whether they should increase the amount of solar or it has to do with the amount of uh, natural gas they take under a contract that has to be executed by the end of the year. That board presentation will, is, uh, is available for anybody to see tomorrow. It's got a wealth of numbers. It shows the risk, the expected top cost, and all the, uh, it's uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 slide deck that uh, will be available for the public to review. The board will not be voting tomorrow on that decision. Uh, they will just be getting having a discussion and vote again at a special meeting by the end of the year. Uh, the third one is carefully study options of securing ne uh, necessary additional supplies from the MISO market, including transmission studies. Uh, that is a very big part of what we're doing right now. The MISO market uh, to the north of us requires firm transmission to ensure delivery. So we have uh, a process in place now to submit once the board approves uh, kind of a direction of how much we want to look at for firm transmission. And once we submit that firm transmission request, it's studied by both MISO and by KU and LG&E. This is subject to transmission um, of payments to both, both those agencies. So it's kind of a, what they call pancaked rate. So we always have to be careful of how much money we spend for transmission access to a market and how much generation we have internal to our system. It's very important for us for cost, but it's even more important that we look at reliability. We have to have enough transmission and enough internal resources and enough power supply to serve our members' loads under the hottest days of the year, the coldest days of the year, uh, considering unit outages or availability of transmission. So we package all that together and give the board a good informed decision about the, the risk of any brownouts or blackouts, at the same time, what the cost of uh, entering into those various plans are. And it's for the board then to uh, digest that different uh, options, put them together, whether it's how much Paducah peaking we have, how much solar we have, how much uh, new contracts we would need, and weigh the market exposure and transmission reliability versus the ability to serve load. But we certainly are very uh, um, keen on what the happens in the MISO market. We spend a lot of time analyzing it, studying it, because we do recognize there are opportunities there. Half of our power last year came from the MISO and PJM markets, just to let you know. So while we have contracts in place, those contracts were very flexible to allow us to buy power if it was cheaper from those markets. And we bought it at a steep discount to what the markets looked like because we had this exposure capped to high prices and at the same time we could take advantage of low prices when they occurred. Um, the fourth item was uh, the opposition uh, to any long-term commitment greater than three years for natural gas or coal due to changes underway in the energy system and financial risks involved. Uh, it's important for the agency to consider marrying up the opportunities they have in front of it. We have firm transmission through the year 2027 to the MISO market. So it might be a, a better opportunity to say we would want a purchase power agreement for a portion of that that matches up to that transmission, that that would mitigate risk. We can go with shorter term contracts, like three years, but that exposes us on the, on the far end. What the agency did to start with, and it's very clear, it's as you see, watch the strategy unfold, was it's a mix of resource types natural gas, coal, hydro, solar, and a mix of terms. So some of them are three years, some were 10 years, some were, are 20 years. And if you stagger in resources, and if you stagger in different resource types, it gives you a nice diversity, so you're not stuck with everything expiring at a certain time, and then you're wondering what you're gonna do next. 
So it's for the board's option, of course, to decide what length of contracts they have. And uh, when we did an RFP for this, we looked for anywhere from three years to 20 years, just so we had a wide range of inputs uh, to what the market opportunities were. So we, uh, we would hate to say that there's a, ever a resolution ever saying going longer than three years, because that uh, might um, hamstring you to something that you really don't want to be stuck with. Um, to have it be uh, a uh, opinion to the board not to go longer than that, uh, that's certainly one thing. To have it be as a resolution, we think could be a, something that you might not like in the future for, all, for a lot of reasons. Uh, number five was uh, the power supply should be no greater than what is needed to meet the actual load of the all requirements mem members plus reasonable industry standard reserve margins. Uh, we agree with that. You'll have to remember uh, a couple of things. One of them is we are in an island inside the lg and &E KU system. So inside that island, we have to have enough transmission access to import capacity. On the other side of uh, that, um, we would maybe have capacity um, that we count towards reserves, but we're also counting something, uh, our ability to uh, pull in other capacity that's not a firm contract for a certain price, but it has to make it so we can attest to how much transmission we have. So let me give you an example. We might need 200 megawatts of transmission, but we might have 100 megawatts of a purchase power agreement, another 100 megawatts of an agreement that's at market. Both those appear to be capacity purchase power agreements on either side. One of them has true capacity that we can accredit. The other one is just uh, capacity that allows us to have that firm point-to-point -point path as required by LG&E and, &E and the MISO markets. So when people count capacity and they say, oh, it looks like you have too much, in reality, our excess capacity was uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 30 to 40 megawatts and that's because we purchased the excess SEPA capacity from our members. If you took that out, our capacity marries up very close to our load. Um, having said that, we understand very clearly that people want to make sure that capacity uh, matches the load. We agree with that. We also have enough capacity to match our load on the hottest uh, day of the year in one in 10 years, they call it, and the coolest, coldest day of the year in, in one in 10. That's a operational issue that people plan for. So they make sure they have not just capacity plus a reserve, but capacity on days over and above that to make sure we have enough uh, import capability. We are not in a market. We are in the KU system, which is a cost-based market, not a true market we can buy from. They have no obligation to sell to us, and that's the only game in town. So we have to make sure we plan accordingly to make sure we have enough capacity to meet our members' needs. And so, the, and I, I'm happy to talk to anybody about that. It always seems a little confusing, and often I'll put a map up to explain the situation we're in. We are truly on an island, um, and there's nothing wrong with that, but we need to plan accordingly to make sure we have ample transmission and capacity. Um, the, let's see. The other part of that uh, was the information about how we do load forecasting, and we are very happy. We've done this on a number of uh, times throughout the years explaining our load forecasting methodology, uh, all the stats that go into that, and uh, we have consultants that do this work for us. We truly have uh, taken our forecast where it was done maybe originally in 2015 and 16 when these contracts were enter entered into. There's been a fresh look at it. Of, if we've lost load, uh, we believe we probably have. COVID makes it very difficult to understand just how much load we lost, but we've readjusted our forecast to try to uh, to make sure we have an accurate forecast for planning, keeping in mind when we plan for transmission, you plan years in advance and you'll plan for uh, blocks of at least five years. And that's kind of how transmission is done. So often it gets to be a little bit lumpy uh, only because we don't have perfect knowledge of where it's going. And I would rather be a little bit long as opposed to being short and not able to serve load. Uh, the final one was uh, FPB staff will analyze the merits of reducing capacity from the Paducah peaking contract from 90 down to 30. I heard some definitive con um, comments earlier that we should just take it down to 30. Uh, that's, a, uh, that's something for the board to decide, but we've laid out a plan. If they take it down to 30, they need to go out to the market and buy much more expensive transmission. And then when they buy that more transmission, they got to go buy capacity to back that up in another market. 
and that capacity they buy could likely be uh, as high priced as Paducah or, or even higher, could be lower. Uh, but there's a risk involved with that. So there's a balance of where the Paducah capacity should go through, uh, go to. And it's not just based on saying we would like to take this unit all the way down to the minimum, but it's what are we going to replace it with? What's our plan? Are we going to serve load? Are we going to have enough reserves? Are we going to have a nice balance of risk and exposure? I encourage uh, anyone on the phone that uh, think that's the right strategy to call into the meeting tomorrow. We show the risk profile of going from 90 down to 30. That was a very specific case we ran in, in anticipation of this. Um, and we wanted to look at it. If it's a good idea, we're going to do it because I don't like spending more for capacity than we need to. But the question becomes, what are we going to do if we don't have enough capacity from the Paducah Peakers, which were inside the KU system? What are we going to do to replace that? And what we're going to do to replace that is, uh, is a number of plans that were laid out and uh, going to be presented to the board for their review tomorrow. And they may choose to go that direction. It's up to the board. Uh, they may choose to say we want to go something that's less risky and less costly and go a different direction. And uh, that's a discussion that they will have tomorrow. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, that uh, concludes my comments. I'm happy to, to field any questions, um, and thank you for having us. We're, uh, we're de delighted. We believe that it's great uh, that Frankfurt started this agency, one of the key members. We're saving all kinds of money. You're, you've been able to give uh, rebates back to your customers, which we think is a, a great positive. And uh, the, the overall, the agency is exactly happy where they want to be. This is where they envision they'd be in uh, year number two and three. And now we're looking forward to the next tranche of what we do in power supply. And, and we welcome everyone's feedback on that. Doug, thank you. With that, I'd like Catherine to turn it back over to you, Gary, and Vint for any comments and to the rest of the board to ask any questions uh, of Doug, Gary, Vint. So, Catherine, I'll turn it back over to you at this point, if that's okay. Sure. Um, I would like to turn to um, Gary and Vint to see what their uh, responses are. Okay. Uh, when please add on, um, you know, um, any other comments additional. The, the one thing I like to say is uh, I will happy to say um, Andy McDonough or other community member to put their common concern, uh, you know, encourage looking for the best solution for all of us in the future. Um, the one concern I did have is the long-term decision for uh, Frankfurt and K1 may particularly affect Frankfurt. That decision should have made by this board and should have fully uh, review and the board going to make that final decision. So one idea we've been talking quite a bit, uh, I believe um, our staff already draft something in front of the board to discussing it is any long-term agreement, any contract commitment from KYME longer than one year, we're going to bring back to the board, ask the board to review it, prove it first before KYME representative, I mean, Frankfurt representative in KYME vote for that. In our process, make sure our the board are going to be the decision maker and also make sure the process in place all the community members can get involved in that process and uh, and also um you know all the concern um from the community we can address that when we make each decision for the future um when do you want to add on or, or any board member can have a comment or question. Yeah, I'll, I'll add if, if, if you're around with that, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I think from what you've heard, uh, listening to uh, Mr. Bresh with KYMEA and, and Gary, and I think what you'll hear from me is, you know, the general concept of, of the resolutions, I don't think anybody has any problems with. I think my concern would be if you start approving very specific resolutions on very specific things, I think you you may end up getting stuck with unintended consequences. While something may look good today, we don't know what uh, environmental regulations are gonna change the market in the next few years. We don't know how 
um, all kinds of things could impact the market. I mean, who foresaw the COVID situation that we're in today? We know how fast our world can change. Um, I think the general concept to remember and always has been all of KYMEA's decisions that they've made, um, we as the largest member are extremely involved with a lot of our staff members, our representative there as currently Gary, and we we have a lot of input into everything that goes on. You know, we're, we're constantly bringing it back and discussing it with you as a board. Um, you know, I can understand a, a resolution if you're concerned that you don't have representation or you don't have, you're not going to know what's going on. But I think clearly, like Gary was talking about, you know, everything's brought back to this board. Any long-term decisions, even short-term decisions are, are reviewed with the Frankfurt Plant Board board members. And so I think the, the best approach is to use that uh, capability that you have and, and look at every situation as it comes up, because the, the situation that you're going to be in for each one of those is going to be different. Your market decisions are going to be different. The world's going to change as we go month to month and year to year. And I think you're better served if you give yourself the ability to adjust and adapt as needed. Um, again, the general idea of what I think the resolution is trying to say is make sure you uh, look into sustainable energy solutions and that you're careful about what you do and you don't make long-term goals without fully considering them. You know, I, I don't think anybody disagrees with that idea. Um, I just think you got to be careful about making simple um, statements and grand statements about things without it, considering all the complexities involved. I think quickly when Mr. Buresh was talking about some of the details, you can see how there's so many interconnected pieces. Um, I've heard people talk about the, the United States power grid is the most complex thing man has ever created. And, you know, to put a few little statements on it and say you won't have any long-term contracts or you won't have this, I'm afraid that would actually just come back to create more harm to us. It, as each one of those little decisions is brought forward to you in the future, I think you can make that decision. Yeah, in this case, a short term is absolutely what we want to do. Or in this case, a long term is what we want to do. You know, you run into situations where if you limit it to three years, what if a better deal was four years or five years? And and I just think I, I would be more concerned about the unintended consequences of putting yourself inside of a box when I think the, the public representation through KYMEA and our public power gives us the ability to adjust and adapt as we need to going forward. So I would just urge the, the board to keep that in mind as they consider this item. Do any other board members uh, have any questions or that to Gary or to Doug or to uh, Vint? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I have a comment if you don't mind. Yes, sir. Not so much a question, just a comment. Um, I, I want to I want to agree with what Vince said and and what Gary said as well. You know, in, in the six uh, in the in the year or so that I've been on this board, um, you know, we are the staff has been extremely open with me, trying to explain a lot of this stuff to me that I wasn't familiar with, and they've done a great job of trying to you know educate me on what's going on. So I, I, that is true. Um, you know, I, th I think a lot of things in the re in the proposed resolution are laudable, but I think a lot of them are kind of short sighted. I think a three year blanket limit on contracts, I just I just don't think it's feasible. Um, I, you know, and and I, and I understand the concerns of of environmentalists and folks that want to go into renewables, but as a board member, I'm also concerned about those people who are struggling to pay their electric. We started off this meeting today by talking about the number of people we have who are in arrears, who are on these payment plans, and the 35% of them that weren't able to pay at all. And, and I think to myself, we need, to, we need to keep the rates as low as we can. And, you know, I don't feel like we want to jump off a bridge and, you know, do things that, that are, are, are not going to make sure that we maximize the value for our rate payers. That's, that's just the only comment I have this time. Okay. Don, Steve? Uh, yeah, I, I, I agree with what John said and, and somewhat what, what, what Vince said. I, I just don't, I, I agree with the points in the resolution in some, in some of, but, but not as restrictive as they are. I do think you have to maintain some flexibility. Uh, but I am with, with uh, 
Andy and 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 his and, and that group in some ways in the sense that I, I'm a cynical person enough to, to want to watch KYMEA. I, I'm 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 not a trust me type person. So I, I, I do feel like I, we need to watch and need to be uh, 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 watchful, I guess I'm using the same word, word uh, twice. The other thing is, I don't, I don't know if the resolution is practical because, uh, maybe realistic, because the next board could come in and, and, and rescind it. So I, I don't think it, you know, if, it, if, the, if the rationale was to, to put some restrictions on what the Frankfurt Plant Board is, 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 uh, can do, I, I don't think that's realistic because we, no board can, can as you know, uh, uh, compel another, the future boards to do something. So in that sense, I do agree with the points in the resolution to some extent. I'm not, I don't want to be as specific, but the, the spirit of what the, the resolution is saying, I agree with. But on the other hand, as I said the other day, when, we were, uh, when I was uh, talking to one of the elected officials, um, the rate payers, the price that the rate payers uh, have to pay is a big factor, and 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 it is the predominant factor for me as it, as it relates to the decision in into where to go with 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 uh, the energy sources. Okay, Don. Yes, um, basically, I agree with what John Snyder and 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 Doug Burrish and Gary have said. I think um, Mr. Burrish has done a good job in answering the points of the resolution. I think it would be short-sighted to lock us in to something, as Vince said, when we don't know the unintended consequences. I think KYMEA has done a good job in involving the public in the IRP process. And I think it's important that we as a board um, be aware of what KYMEA is doing as we are and that we have the opportunity to respond, which we do. And I, I think KYMEA has been good for Frankfurt as uh, has been mentioned earlier, you know, we've given a rebate two years in a row. We have no rate increases in the foreseeable future when KULG&E has gone before the PSC to ask for the third rate increase in three years. So I think KYMEA has been successful for Frankfurt and our rate payers. I think it's important that we keep our rates as low as possible. And I think that renewables are important. And of course the um, industry is moving away from carbon to renewables. But I think that we have to give things time to, to work also. And so why I really appreciate the involvement of Mr. McDonald and those that have commented today. I, I would not, I, I think the, the board passing a resolution is short-sighted. Catherine, do you have a, some kind of thoughts on, on how you want to proceed at this point? I do. Um, uh, so first of all, you know, again, I thank um, Envision Franklin County for bringing this because this has caused this whole discussion. Mm -hmm. And um, adopting the resolution or not, um, what it has done is brought this not just before us to make us think long and hard and keep us on the right tracks, but also for um, Kimi, and I appreciate um uh, the CEO, Doug Buresh, being here um, and hearing. So, I mean, this is one, one way that there is directive out there. Um, the IRP, the um, integrated resource planning process, is the, is the other. Now, whether it should have happened a while back or not, um, you know, we are where we are and it is happening and it's an important process and it is by design transparent. Um, our general manager, um, Gary Zhang, in, in my experience since uh, July, is very communicative. And I know he's a very active um, member, obviously, of KYMEA. Um, I think he's on every committee. Um, 
And I think we're getting the best representation we can possibly get on KYMEA through Gary. Um, I tend to uh, like the phrase, never say never. Um, so I, I would have to agree that, um, you know, if this resolution could really turn around on us and hamstring us, and I don't think that's really what we, we intend. And even through the public comments, um, you know, although um, the ones, the, the written ones were in favor of this, the resolutions as drafted by um, Mr. McDonald, um, you could see that they each had a different um, primary focus. You know, one was lowest cost reliable electricity. One was um, more environmental. Um, and sustainability isn't just um, protection of the env environment at all costs. It's, it means um, in a manner where people aren't going to unduly suffer. And um, we literally all uh, have neighbors right now who are far behind on their payments. So again, we don't know what could happen in the future. COVID is an example. Um, I think the good news is based on the response, response given that um, uh, we are on track with what these, the proposed resolutions um, uh, were highlighting. Um, Gary mentioned that there, there is a kind of an alternative resolution that um, reflects what he was saying, which is um, to um, make sure that any contract for more than a year is brought back to us. And more importantly, that KYMEA understands that our representative, because it's not always gonna be Gary, you know, I'm sure one day he might wanna retire. Um, and he's, I trust that he's gonna bring it back, but um, if he's um, on board with a resolution about bringing uh, mandating that anything over a year contract has to be brought back to the plant board before our representative can vote on it. Um, I would at least like us to consider that if we can all agree on on that point. And I can read the draft, kind of an alternative draft resolution. Um, uh, I don't know technically if, if we can vote on this tonight, but if we, I could read it and see what people's um, uh, comments are about it. And if nothing else, we could use it tonight as sort of a, a verbal instructions because Gary's going to, to that meeting tomorrow. Okay. Um, I think uh, Hans is, uh, because of the notice, I don't think we can take a, we don't have the formal resolution to vote on, but I think if I'm not mistaken, Hans, if Catherine wants to read uh, that draft and we can kind of a, uh, what Steve Mason and I and John Snyder are coming out of the General Assembly is kind of like, we used to always call it like a sense of the General Assembly. We can kind of give Gary that verbal uh, sense of the board this evening. And then January, we could adopt a more formal resolution. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Absolutely. That's correct. Okay. Catherine, you want to read it? All right. Whereas the Electric and Water Plant Board of the City of Frankfort, Kentucky is a member of the Kentucky Municipal Energy Agency, whereas FPB's board of directors appoints a representative and an alternate representative to attend KYMEA meetings. Whereas FPB's representatives vote on a wide range of matters that affect the operation of KYMEA. Whereas FPB's representatives are sometimes required to vote on the procurement of power supply resources. Whereas these decisions regarding power supply resources can have a significant financial impact to FPB. Whereas these decisions regarding power supply resources can also significantly, significantly impact the sustainability of FPB's power su supply portfolio. Whereas these decisions regarding power supply resources can also significantly impact the reliability of FPB's power supply portfolio. Now, now therefore, be it resolved that, that the FPB's representatives, one, 
will represent the FPB board of directors, any power supply resource will present to the FPB board of directors, any power supply resource proposed by KYMEA that has a contract term of more than one year. Two, will seek direction and guidance from FPB's board of directors prior to taking any action regarding a power supply resource with a term of more than one year at a KYMEA board meeting. And three, will follow the directions from FPB's board when voting to secure a power supply resource with a term of more than one year. Do, uh, do any of the board members, is that something that if Gary, you know, obviously he and Vin are going tomorrow to a meeting as a matter of policy and direction for them tomorrow. And then with a more formal document in January as a meet, as a matter of giving some policy direction to them, uh, does anybody have any concerns, problems, uh, changes um, to that, or does everyone feel comfortable with that kind of general directive for Gary and Gary, do you feel comfortable with that directive? Uh, Mr. Chair, if you don't mind, Yes, sir. Uh, I think I think uh, I think Doug in his presentation mentioned that the that the options will be presented to the members at the meeting tomorrow, but they weren't going to vote on it tomorrow at the meeting anyway. Was I right on that, Doug? Is that is that where it's supposed to be? All right. <laughs> Yes, that's correct. I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry, to, sorry to wake you up. You know, but, but you all going to present it, and then, then you all will have a, you all will have a special meeting before the thirty first. Correct. Uh, that's right. Yeah. So we're got a special meeting on the 29th Is the plan that would get everybody time to see the um, all the plans laid out, have discussion tomorrow, and and then vote at that point. Okay. And now so the plans they're voting on is not a contract. Uh, there, even if there could be an element of a purchase power agreement, that will not be presented. That's for the the vote will be for the, the staff to pursue uh, the options that the board uh, recommends. So, so for, from that from that perspective, Mr. Chairman, I, I think I, I you know I think we the, the thought process on my end would be once those things are uh, once those things are presented at the meeting and before that 29th, I would envision us probably having a special meeting where we discuss some of those options and, and kind of give the staff direction on how to vote there. Yes, I think you're correct. Uh, Steve, Don. Well, you know, I, I think this resolution only in some way formalizes what we already think is happening anyway. It should be. Right. So, I mean, it's no brain to me. Right. Don? I'm okay with discussing it in a special meeting. I, I would not want to vote on it tonight. Okay. How about this, is, uh, Catherine? What about if we, it's my understanding, and this would be kind of in the form of a motion or a resolution. I'm not motion, but kind of a, a motion. Based on our understanding that uh, Gary will be going to a Kimi meeting tomorrow to get information and that the final vote or the next vote that Kimi will take will be the 29th, that uh, Gary understands that uh, we definitely want to get a special meeting scheduled between now and the 29th to review that that Gary won't take vote anything tomorrow, which we understand is not up for a vote, but that he take no vote tomorrow on committing that to we have a chance to come back and review it in a special meeting before the 29th. And that uh, Kathy Poe contact everybody tomorrow and get a date between now and the 29th when we can have that meeting, get the information tomorrow, get it posted, make it available. So everybody has a chance to review it. Uh, and the public has a chance to see it before we would have that special meeting. Does that seem like a fair way to proceed? Yes. Is everybody okay with that? I guess not asking for a formal vote. Can we just have a big okay? <laughs> Remember everybody? Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Thank you, Aunt Catherine. Thank you. All right. And thank you for um, for all this time to to really look at this. And thank you to the the Griffiths and Miss Rosen and Mr. McDonald. Uh, for all their comments. Okay. Gary, you, you, you've got your mission now, right? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Item 7.4, auto renewal of NCTC C-SPAN agreement, Harvey. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Uh, the the FPB is a 
is a, a participating member in an existing NCTC C-SPAN agreement uh, that auto renews every two years uh, unless um, unless the board decides to terminate uh, the services. No action is required, uh, so that's why this is an informational item. Staff recommends that we would continue under the NCTC C-SPAN agreement. Uh, they provide coverage of various governmental agencies, and, and they brought their bus here to Frankfurt in the past, and uh, we think they provide good service to our customers. So, so we don't, unless a board member wants to make a motion and not renew, we don't have to take any action. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Does anybody want to make a motion or otherwise uh, silence means we're renewing? Okay. 7.5. Harvey, I think this is uh, you and, and Kathy uh, and so forth. I think you all got some something for us to see, right? Yes, sir. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to let Miss Lindsay uh, take the lead on, on this one and then I'll jump in uh, in a little bit. Okay, great. Well, tonight you've heard an update from Adam about our fiber to the home project. And I hope you guys are getting as pumped up as we are about it because this is our next generation telecommunication network that's going to give our customers access to the fastest internet speeds around. Uh, it's going to be the basis on which our community will work, learn, communicate, and play over the next several decades. Therefore, communicating the value and the benefits of this network to our current and potential customers is essential. So that makes branding our new fiber product a priority. As we maintain our legacy HFC network until we complete the fiber overbuild, uh, we felt the need to differentiate these services in particular, highlighting how we are introducing and building a next generation network and the products that it delivers as something new and different and something next level. So because we're excited about our fiber to the home product and the services it will enhance, it is important to us to match that enthusiasm with the marketing of the product with a next level brand. So with that, we are very excited to present to you uh next band introducing frankfurt's future network now next band the Frankfurt Plant Board is excited to deploy this next generation fiber to the home and business service that will make our city and county even more attractive in terms of business recruitment, education, work, play, and quality of life. Next Band is fast, but it's only the beginning. It's more reliable than copper networks. It's more secure and more flexible than current internet delivery options. It can even add value to your home. Studies show homes with a fiber connection rise in value by an average of 3%. NextBand is being rolled out in phases now to meet today's increasing demands, but it's adaptable for technologies of tomorrow. It's basically future-proof. Over the coming months, we will be showcasing the advantages of fiber and encouraging homes and businesses to switch. Welcome to NextBand, Frankfurt's future network now. Yay! Yeah. <laughs> we're, very, good. we're very excited about the branding. We're very excited about the product. And I'm going to turn it over to Harvey now to talk a little bit about where we've been, what we're doing, and our next steps. Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, we are we are super excited, and we know that building excitement and building anticipation uh, is going to be the key for for launching a new product. And um, so, doing that, working on on the communication strategy and marketing plan as we move forward. Um, that's why we've been working with uh, some folks out of Somerset uh, from from a firm called KSD to help us, uh, you know, help our new brand reach uh, its full potential. So we've got uh, tonight with us uh, Kirby Stevens from, from KFD, and he's going to um, share a little bit about the, the processes that, that, that we went through to, to get to where we are and uh, answer any questions you guys might have. And um, so we appreciate the time to appreciate his time and, and y'all's time to, to listen to us. So uh, Kirby, thanks for, for coming on. Glad to be here, Harvey. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Gotcha. Okay. 
Um, well, uh, first of all, thanks a lot for involving us in this project. It's been uh, a lot of fun to work on and uh, working with the marketing team at Frankfurt Plant Board and trying to put together the plans for how this is going to come to life. Uh, the video that we just played kind of gives an overview of the direction and the feeling that we have about the, the new brand and the direction for it. Uh, what we'd like to do is just talk a little bit about um, who we are and uh, maybe step back just a little bit. And I don't know if we can get access to uh, taking over the screen. I think you can. Okay. All right. Is everybody seeing our screen now? No. 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 Okay. All right. We're trying to get there. <laughs> There we go. Okay, can you see all that now? Okay. Yes. yes. All right, so anyways, we've been in business for um, over three decades. And as Harvey said, we're down in Somerset, Kentucky. And um, we work on uh, design and branding uh, communication projects uh, in Kentucky and beyond. Um, some of our <clears throat> recent projects have involved both utility and telecom companies. One of the ones that we've worked with recently to launch a new uh, fiber to the home, fiber to the business service was with Barberville Utilities. And uh, we introduced successfully and it's they're still uh, signing on new customers, but their uh, rollout has been very successful so far. And their product was, uh, the name that we came up with was called Blink, and uh, it's it's ongoing. Um, you had the discussion with Doug uh, Varesh and KYMEA. That was another um, energy utility type uh, company that we've been involved with in developing the branding for initially a few years back. And a company that we've actually been working with for uh, well over 25 years is called Duo Broadband, and they, when we began working with them, they were a telephone co-op, and we've kind of transitioned with them throughout the years to be really a, a, a broadband company. Uh, so fiber to the home, fiber to the business is very much what they're about, and they've gone from being uh, serving two counties uh, to now serving six uh, counties in South Central Kentucky. So let's get into uh, the project that uh, we just introduced to you. Um, so one of the things that we did was look at a lot of um, these type projects, not only in Kentucky, but across the nation, just to look at the competitive field out there and what other people were doing. There's a lot of fiber names, there's a lot of net names and so forth. And we went through a lot of different names your marketing team had gone through a lot of different names um, and gave us all the ones that they had been through over the years. So we uh, narrowed that down. Uh, the idea of uh, fiber optic broadband is only gaining more momentum. Uh, obviously the whole COVID um, pandemic has really driven even more need for uh, fast, uh, reliable, internet service, broadband service. So the demand is not going to go away. Um, a couple of the goals that the marketing team, your marketing team really identified for us was to be able to appeal to younger audiences, um, to attract people that were coming into the community and really serve as a, a, an economic development tool because anyone moving into a new community or businesses moving into a new community, they're looking for uh, connection to advanced fiber optics. Uh, so that is part of how we were getting to the name that we were getting to. You know, uh, everyone knows that name, broadband. But what's next? Well, uh, 
as you saw, it's next man. So, you know, it's, it's the future network, but it's happening now and it's going to keep happening for uh, years to come. And the idea of next band is that you're not limited to, you know, what's available today, next band and, and your fiber optic network is really uh, going to open up opportunities that maybe you don't even know exactly what they are today as far as the use of it. But the, the, breadth and width and speed that uh, fiber optic offers uh, it really allows that flexibility so you know this drawing of this logo is is stylized it's a the idea of a fiber optic cable with a point of light uh, it's got we've got the bright color palette uh, that's part of this and it really kind of hits a point and expands out uh, to offer all these possibilities uh, as you saw in the video presentation, we're working on uh, different uh, presentations, cards that can be handed out uh, as your folks get into the community. Uh, new customer folders, these are possible designs that uh, could be used to hand out customer information uh, to educate and also for contracts and so forth. Uh, we are developing a um, informational brochure that is going to be part of a uh, campaign that we will be developing with letters that will be going out to customers. And these, all these uh, elements are part of an overall marketing strategy that we're putting together with your marketing team uh, to start to introduce NextBand into the Frankfurt community. Uh, there will be opportunities inside and outside of your facilities uh, to identify and educate and market NextBand uh, to the community. These are some ideas for some banners uh, that could happen in the facility, even outside as you're driving up the driveway into uh, the Frankfurt Plant Board. Uh, of course, uh, billboard advertising uh, is something that's a strong possibility as part of the marketing plan. Uh, you know, they were talking about some of your uh, first adopters that you're going to be uh, testing the network with and trying out. So we can imagine that uh, some of those folks would agree to uh, put a sign up possibly in their yard. Uh, to be able to say, hey, we, we've got this service, um, uh, wouldn't you like to have it too? Uh, obviously, there will be uh, apparel that will be developed, you know, some caps, some clothing, shirts that will be branded along with Frankfurt Plant, plant Board uh, brand. Uh, trucks will be labeled uh, to start to identify and how far we go with that it will be, I uh, suppose, a matter of marketing budget and uh, whether you do uh, more full wraps or whether it's just the simple uh, symbol that's identifying it. But that's something that we're working through with the marketing team. I uh, don't know if this is going up tonight, but it should be going up soon that we'll be doing a uh, just an introduction on the website for people to learn more uh, about uh, NextBand. And essentially, I think you're going to link Harvey, uh, I don't know if that's the way y'all are working this tonight, but you're going to link to a, a news release on the website. Um, that's correct. No, okay. Okay. Um, social media will become a big part of this and the marketing of the of the next band product. And then there will be print advertising um, that will be introducing. So there will be a whole strategy that we're working through. We've done a preliminary plan that we presented back in October uh, and we're st uh, still working through with the team and we'll be uh, refining that and uh, detailing that uh, in the next month or so as we begin to roll this out. So um, that's kind of the synopsis of all the work that's been being done uh, over the last little bit and um, if you've got any questions or comments, we'd love to hear them. Kathy, as far as uh, your marketing budget, have you got money built in for this year for the marketing 
on this or do is that something we're gonna have to consider or do you already have you already earmarks and funds uh we have harvey can you back me up on this yeah yeah no, i think we're we're in good shape uh to get through certainly this fiscal year and uh you know we'll maybe we'll assess when it's budget time on on what we might need moving forward but i think we're in we're in good shape uh, to get this rolled out right okay uh, do any board members have some questions of kathy or uh, ksd or harvey Awesome. Uh, I just want to thank uh, Kirby for being with us tonight. And again, if anybody if have, has any questions, uh, again, I want to reiterate that we've really enjoyed working with KSD. Uh, it's nice to have somebody to, you know, bring in some ideas and that kind of helps us, uh, you know, get to talking and, and really uh, decide the, the right direction we need to be moving in here in our community. And uh, we think this will be, I mean, not only are we excited about the brand, but obviously the product itself is going to be awesome for Frankfurt. And, and so we, and it's going to be around for a while. So that's why yeah. we want, we really wanted a brand uh, that, that people can recognize. And it is a part of the, of the Frankfurt plant board, but we, we think it's special enough that it can stand on its own a little bit and um, really be a part of, something special that we're doing for our community. Well, Kathy, you, Harvey, Adam, as always, you all have done a great job. Thank you so much. Mm. And uh, yeah. we're, we're excited to see what's coming next. And uh, we know this is going to be, you know, we're phasing in. So this is, a, this is part of, this is the big, just the beginning for us. <laughs> so what all the board members have to paint next band then on their roof, is that right? <laughs> Well, I think that might be in the marketing plan. I don't know. Right? <laughs> uh, we've been suggesting tattoos for board members. So. Is right? <laughs> okay. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. Item 8.1, uh, consider approval of standard pole attachment agreement. Uh, Vent. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'll defer to Hans if he wants to jump in here pretty soon. My, uh, it is a contract. Uh, it is our standard contract we use for joint use agreements with other uh, entities that want to get on our polls. It is fairly common to have other entities do this. So um, it, they've agreed to our standard agreement. So I, I don't, there's really nothing out of the ordinary here. I don't know, Hans. And this is not an option, one. right? Uh, right. No, we, we do allow people on the polls. Now they're they they get on the polls by the rules and regulations we have. Again, this is following our our standard agreement that is in the tariff. Okay, and, and we can't deny people if they meet the guidelines. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's correct. I, th I think Vent hit the nail. Vent hit the nail on the head. Uh, we have to let people on the polls with uh, under sa same kind of same same concept that we use in delivering all our services under non non discriminatory terms and conditions which is our, our standard agreement there. So uh, we just ask that, ask that the board move to uh, move to approve the, uh, the standard poll attachment agreement. Okay. Any questions of Hans or Vint? I have a question. Does this uh, inhibit any of our last subjects we just spoke about moving forward with our fiber? No, sir. Chair, I just had a, a comment because sure. I recently um, was kind of brought up to speed about uh, these type contracts. And I just think it's important to point out that one of the conditions in these contracts is if there's any costs um, incurred by us, that that also has to be paid for by the the company doing the leasing agreement. That's a good point to bring up. It's no cost to our rate payers. Okay. <laughs> hey. Let me any ask further questions? Question. Uh, I'm piggybacking on Catherine's question. What what about the maintenance of those poles once somebody is on? Do they have to participate in in any upkeep or? Um, they 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 are required if if the issues are specific to their facilities, we notify them, and they're required within so many days to to remedy and fix the issues. But the overall, like for instance, the pole itself, maintenance of the pole, of course, it wears out over time. They pay an annual rental fee, and those fees are, are the idea is that they pay for the upkeep of those facilities. Let me ask you this, Vince. Steve brought up a good point. 
if something would happen in a storm or whatever, poles get knocked down, do we have to reattach their wire? Or do they have to come back in and reattach their own wire? They they come back in and reattach. If it's an emergency and, for instance, you know, you were blocking an ambulance or something, could we make some adjustments so something could get through? Absolutely. But generally, on a normal case, you have an ice storm come through, they're going to fix their equipment. We don't we don't uh, we don't adjust their stuff. OK. OK. I have no other questions. Do I have a motion? So move. A second. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Adopted. Next item is, uh, let's see, uh, number 8.2, consider approval of the revised Broadway plat. It is an issue that we've discussed various times in the past. Uh, we got Charlie Jones, Hans, and Vin here. Who's going to take the lead on this? I guess I'll, I'll start it. And if you have specific questions on a, a piece of it or something, we can ask Charlie. But it, uh, basically, it's fairly simple. Um, the plant board is with this uh, uh, plant, the plant board is reducing its use of the lot. Um, it, it is an old substation lot that we had with the original startup of the, of the plant board. Um, basically, we have some telecommunications facilities still on the lot and a little bit of some overhead electric lines. So this flat adjustment basically realigns it so that the, the facilities that we have on the lot are continued to be protected and we can make adjustments as we need to. And then the rest of the lot will be used with the city can to help with some of their downtown redevelopment efforts and the city owns um, this property right the city owns this uh, lot this lot wow. yes sir i believe they own it yes, um sir. yes sir yes okay any questions event hans or charlie okay do i have a motion a oh, motion yeah. A second? I'll second. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion's adopted. Number 8.3. Consider award of bid invitation number 1705 Juniper Equipment uh, to Trace 3 LLC in the amount of $48,480.84. Adam. Yes, sir. Uh, so we have the, it's time to spend some money on the next gen. Uh -huh. <laughs> so basically, uh, staff prepared bid 1705 for uh, Juniper routers. Uh, these are to upgrade our infrastructure that we use currently with the HSC plant as well as fiber to the home. Uh, staff recommends going with the low bidder Trace 3 in the amount of $48,480.84. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, any questions? Mr. Chairman? Yes. Mr. Chairman, I've got one. Uh, Adam? Yes, sir. Uh, the, the one bidder here who's, uh, wants to wants to charge us uh, so much, are those gold-plated routers, the one that? Uh... Well, maybe uh, during, during the COVID times, you know, hardware is getting kind of hard to come by, so maybe it's a, a premium there, so. Mr. But the Chairman. quality that you feel the the quality and everything of what we're buying here is good. Yes, sir. It's the same equipment. It was it was apples and apples, and there's still okay. that much separation. Okay, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, if it's yes, in order, I'd like to uh, make a motion we award bid invitation number one seven zero five to Juniper to uh, Trace Three LLC. Okay. Do we have a second? Second. Okay, we got a second. Uh, any discussion? Seeing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Adopted. Number 8.4. Consider award of bid invitation number 1706 mobile TV transcoding equipment to DASCOM systems in the amount of $132,393. Adam, you're on a roll, buddy. Yes, sir. Uh, this is another standard bid we sent out for uh, transcoding equipment. This is part of the over-the-top Mobi product line we're launching as part of the next-gen platform. Uh, the basically, um, I th uh, who was it here? It was well, I didn't lost my train of thought. Dascom systems were uh, basically had the best bid as far as deliverables. I think there might have been 
$70 difference in price, but they had a better delivery date. And we're trying to get this equipment in and get it turned up could kind of match with the launch of fiber to the home. Okay. And this is a budgeted, so yeah, this I is guess, budget. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes. This is a any, budgeted amount. Any discussion, any questions of Adam on this? Okay. Seeing none, do we have a motion? So move. Do we have a second? I'll second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Mo uh, oh, bids awarded. Number 8.5. Consider, this is just your whole show tonight, isn't it, Adam? Consider mm -hmm. approving the renewal of master service agreement with Big River Telephone Company. Yes, Adam? Sir. Yes, sir. We'll see if third time's a charm. Uh, staff recommends approval of master service agreement with Big River uh, Telephone. The, this is a five-year agreement starting January 19 of 2021. Uh, FPB has been using Big River since 2016 when we decided to uh, stop actually switching traffic here locally because of the cost of equipment and upgrades we were faced to looking at making. Um, Big River has done a good job for the last five years. Uh, so this is just a renewal of that agreement. There were some minor uh, changes in pricing that you know, actually it favors FPB. Hans has looked at the contract and everything seems to be in order and just would ask for approval. Okay, uh, did we take bids on this or was it, a, what was our process? No, this was, this was kind of like professional services we did. And this company actually to, if we decide to rebid it, it would cost a lot more. This is kind of a renewal because if we actually try to rebid this, we would actually have to do another conversion and switch to another company, bring more equipment in. It's a pretty painstaking process. And the performance with Big Rivers, they've been good. We've not had problems with them and they're reliable. And it's, it's, they've done, done a good job for us. Any questions of Adam? Okay, do I have a motion? So move. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed? Thank you. Because the contract's approved. Thank you, Adam. Next item is 8.6. Uh, consider retaining Blue and Company to conduct the 2021 FPB financial audit for a fee of $33,000. Uh, I've talked with David Denton about this. Um, coming out of the state auditor's office, the state auditor's office a number of years ago under Auditor Llewellyn uh, adopted some standards for local governments, uh, special districts and so forth, that as a matter of best practice, it was good for firms, uh, for agencies to periodically rotate auditors, both from the standpoint of having a fresh set of eyes look at the agency and that it was just good not to just continue to renew contracts. There was no problem with our, our current auditor but it was, uh, I think David had been, what, four years that we'd been using our previous auditor? Yes, sir. And so you all put it out in RFP, had a number of, uh, from what I understand, some all very good firms. And you all had a process that you went through, scored these, and this was the firm that came out on top. You want to take it from here? Well, you uh, put it just right there. It was, uh, I think, November 2nd. We did release a uh, request for proposal to nine different uh Accounting firms, we did receive three responses back. Uh, we also advertised the RFP locally in State Journal. Um, as you mentioned, three responses, all three were credible, independent firms. Uh, it really comes down to uh, what the board's pleasure is, but uh, Blue & Company is the firm that offered, uh, did have the lowest uh, initial year and, and subsequent years for the uh, audit. Now over a five year term, this is a, a year by year thing we'll bring to the board and request uh, request approval for an audit uh, firm to be retained. So this will be just for requests for the first year, the 2021 audit. Um, we're just gonna see if the board would, would be good with approving, uh, extending out to Blue and Company and asking for an engagement letter for this year. Okay, does anybody have some questions of David about this or the process or the firm? I think everybody had a chance to see the uh, proposals uh, the firms that uh, uh, bid. Uh, does anybody have any questions of David? I just had I one. Go on. Oh, <laughs> I just had one question. When I looked at it, I didn't notice any Frankfurt firms. 
So I just wondered if any, uh, if anything was sent out to firms in Frankfurt or they just didn't reply or why no one local was considered. We uh, sent out to nine different firms and then advertised locally. I, I don't know um, why, why none locally applied, but um, I'm glad we got a few responses. <laughs> Thanks. Any other questions of David? Yeah, my question is, uh, is it, is the reason we've gone five consecutive years with this contract is for cost? Uh, I mean, because it kind of goes back to John's point about how many years you use the same audit firm. Uh, and five years is, is, is getting excessive really in, in, in using the same audit firm. So is it only, is, is the only reason we are doing this because it, it made the cost cheaper? So, you know, a firm, not only are we, um, it's kind of an investment in a way. Firms, when you get in, you, you make a bid for an audit, you get into the middle of it. Uh, it's, I've actually kind of been on the other side of this. Um, once you get into an audit, usually the first year, you're usually not gonna make any money on it. So we ask for a five-year price to just get a trajectory of what the fees would be estimated at. And then we do say in the RFP that it would be renewed on a year-by-year -year basis. So it's just to get a feel for over a five-year term, what that would look like in terms of cost. Um, so we're not we're not committing to any more than one year uh, with an engagement letter uh, signed for just this 2021 year. Mm. Hope that answers. I think to go to to go to Steve's question, we certainly could have had the option to renew our current audit firm okay. again, and we're kind of following the state auditors, state auditor of public accounts best practices in terms to renew to rebid periodically and change audit firms. Is that correct? Absolutely. It, it takes a little while for an audit firm to get to understand you, your books as a client. So you, you need a few years uh, auditing one client to really, uh, you, you dig a little deeper every year and get to know them a little better. So I'd also have a problem if you were to all take, rotate firms too quickly, that would be a problem possibly the other well, way. So. Uh, well, I, I agree, but once you get to around a third or fourth year, the familiarity that the audit firm has with you can become a liability uh, yes. on just both fronts. So, and that's why I'm asking, they also know that it, at, at that fourth year that they probably may not get the contract. And that's why I asked the question, why, why was the initial five years? You're right, the first year is a big investment on the audit firm because they have to go through and do all their research and understand the company. But the third and fourth year, they know you, they're just coming back, checking on stuff that, you know, they- yeah, just, and, I, and I think uh, to, to Steve's point, I think since the, the state auditor issued those guidelines um, several years ago, I think uh, fiscal courts, city governments, uh, county clerk, sheriff, everybody that's using a private firm has pretty much adhered to that, that guideline to report, to uh, periodically rebid and, and change audit firms as kind of as a matter of best practice. Is that fair, David? Yes, sir. So we're basically just kind of following that best practice on this. And we got a and we got a price that basically is coming in a little bit under budget, which is good. I mean, we're in that ballpark where we were. Mr. Chairman, I yes. Mean, I, I've got I want to follow up on Steve's question a little bit. I just kind of understand where Steve's coming from. Uh David, if we had gone to a three or four year term, how much how much higher would her would our annual cost have been any higher, I guess is what I'm asking. I do not believe so. The way that we worded the request for proposal was to give us a pricing for fiscal year 21 through fiscal year 25 with the understanding that we would review the work of the audit firm year after year, and it would be a year over year approval by the board. So. We just did a, we could have asked for a 10 year pricing, a three year pricing. Um, it was just the way that we put it out there was to get a feel for what would the trend of audit fees be year over year. Firms like most businesses have a natural inflation that they're trying to make up for. And just to get a feel for what that would look like when we come back and say in fiscal year 22, we would like to renew with Blue and Company. I would hope that that fee would be 33,650 as their RFP stated. So and if they didn't want, if they wanted to raise it a lot, we could reject it and rebid at that point, they or we could, could renew. 
but, like but, the, but John, the best practice that you mentioned, it's fact it's been around a long time. I mean, that's yes. that, that's been forever, that standard of of changing after three or four years. So they know that and 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 again back to what John was saying, we, we spoke you we prefaced this with that while we were changing, but yet here we are, we entered into a five year contract when we know if this board is intact like it is. After the third year or perhaps the fourth year, we're gonna we're gonna move on to another mm -hmm. and should move on. Actually, yes. so that's why I asked the question: why why was it a five year uh, term as opposed to a three or four year term? But that's really moot yes. for, the, for what we're doing. So, so I hope just to make sure everybody understands, we asked for five years of pricing, but we are only agreeing to one year of an audit. Um, so. We will come back to you this time, December of 21, and ask um, if everything goes well, I'm sure it will, to renew for a second year with, with this firm. But they are understand, and I'll, uh, the RFP stated, uh, and the engagement letter just will be for one year as well that we'll actually sign. So, yes, sir, this is a, I, I was around for the good old Sarbanes-Oxley and the rotation of mm -hmm. all the partners and all that good stuff. So, so this is very common practice, and, and uh, they're not, we're not surprising them in any way. Okay. If there's no further uh, questions, do we have a motion? So moved. A second. Second. <laughs> okay. Do we have any discuss? Do we have any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. No one's opposed. Contracts awarded. Uh, next item, eight point seven. This is a matter. Of, I think we just have to accept the minutes of the cable advisory committee. Uh, that you got in there in front. Does anybody have any questions? Harvey's available to discuss, or do we have a motion? Okay, do we have a motion? Move we approve the minutes of the uh, Cable Advisory Committee. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion, a second. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes accepted. Number nine, informational item. Uh, Mr. General Manager, do you have any words for us? Thank you. I do have make a really simple. Uh, I had a conversation with uh, County Judge, uh, Mr. I mean, Houston Well, and also City Manager regard to the collection issue we're going to we already talked quite a bit about it as you know the county and the city both uh had a plan to help the customer and i really like to use this chance to encourage customer contact us to figure out some solution you know uh before the january early january yes. um deadline so that's the only thing I like to mention. There are okay. a lot of opportunity there still available to help people. Uh, I really encourage them contact us or contact all the firm mentioned. I mean, we mentioned it early, Cassie mentioned early, contact them, reach out, help, ask for help. Thanks, Gary. Uh, number 10, any old or new business to bring up? Okay, seeing none, yeah. number 11. May I ask a uh, question under, under old and new business? I mean, it's yeah. back to what Gary, uh, as it relates to, to the outstanding utility bills, and this is probably a crazy question, but I, 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 I would be curious as how many of them are under $100? Uh, and I'm only asking the, the question in the sense that, that you know, there might be people out there that will pay a bill, someone's bill. Uh, you know, if it's a, Secret Santa comes by and says, you know, I got $500, pay these bills that will, you know, that pay the most bills that it would pay. And it's I'm major. not asking. Yeah, as you know, we do have the program in place. You know, people can donate their um, money to help other people. They also can dedicate, you know, um, David, please help me, you know, on that program too, right? Um, yeah, if so it helps you, uh, Mr. Mason, the average past due balance for a residential customer as of the end of November was $598. Uh, 
that's the, the average past due balance for a, a residential customer. And as uh, Mr. Zing uh, discussed, we have the power gift certificates and also the roundup program that uh, for any customer that would like to help out uh, their neighbors or others in need during this time of year, that's a, it's a great way to do it. So going to Steve's specific question, David, can you look there real quick? How many customers are like at a hundred dollars or less total rearage? I don't have that. I don't have the ability to do it that quickly right now, but uh, we can get that information for you. Okay. Would you please? Sure. Tomorrow. Okay. Yes. And I had another question as it relates to the, uh, the donations from, you know, if I, the roundup program and, and, and if I wanted a gift card, the gift card, I guess, is specific to whoever I want to give it to. Uh, the Roundup money, how is it uh, given out? So the Roundup money is, is sent to the Bluegrass Community Action okay, okay. here locally in Frankfurt, and then they'll put that towards their, their winter care funds. Okay. Mr. Mason, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned the Roundup. I still believe that's a, one of the best way to help our neighbors because uh, you really average only 50 cents, maximum is 90 cents, mm -hmm. minimum is one penny every month. Yeah. Um, so I think that's a great way to help. I agree. Okay. Mr. Chair? Yes. Um, I'd like to make a motion we move to closed session pursuant to carry at 61 8 10. 1C to discuss pending litigation regarding subcontractor lien. Do I have a second? Second. Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, we're going into closed session. We're out of uh, closed session and we're back in. Uh, no action was taken. There's no action taken as a result of closed session. Do I have a motion to adjourn? So move. So second. second. Okay, with that, uh, we're adjourned. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>